Carl Marie, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Hey there. Hello. Where are you guys? Uh, Walter's in New York. I'm in uh, in Romania. So same continent. Oh, same continent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically, I'm in New York. Yeah. How's it know. going over there? It's fine. I mean, pretty uh, cold, but you know, no civil unrest anymore. So that's a plus. <laughs> Baby yeah. steps, right? Baby steps. Baby steps. <laughs> Wow. Well, it's a, it's a thrill to have you on uh, our little Global Gab podcast. What did you say? Here. Was that Global Gab? The Global Gab. We're, we're doing a rebranding, <laughs> Carl Marie, and you are you are an, uh, a huge part of that that effort. So thanks for being here. Okay. What is what is the podcast called? Well, it was well, Walter. Why don't you explain? Yeah. All right. About a decade ago, while David was living in Japan, we started this show called Global Gab. Yeah. Gab is just like chatting, you know, shooting the shit. And then we failed at making a show. We gave up really early on. Okay. The pandemic started and we said, well, let's start this, rebrand it maybe, because the world is gagging. Let's call it Global Gag. <laughs> oh my God, that's so lame. <laughs> Which is why we're thinking of making, turning it back, turning back time right now. Okay. Exactly. Well, I mean, literally turning back time because we haven't seen you in in ten years, right? No, it's, I actually thought about that earlier this day. I was like, when was Grunt Weeks? It was it was two thousand eleven. Oh my god, it, that's that's ten years ago. What the fuck? Where did all that time go? It went away. It went away. <laughs> like it made me feel really old. Like <laughs> I was eighteen at the time, but now I'm twenty eight. Like, where did all those years go? Yeah, well, Walter and I, we're actually only, Walter and I are six days apart, and we are turning 30, like, very soon. It's uh, terrifying. That's, that's adult life. <laughs> yeah, it's it's also, the real deal. <laughs> like, Shoop, you look really adult, like, in a suit and everything. <laughs> you know, hey, fun fact, I actually wore this, I had this shirt and this uh, this coat in Denmark when we were all uh, all hanging out in Grundvig. Really? So I think it was, it was the, the only two articles of clothing that I, I still had remaining from those days. So I had to, had to dig it out of the closet and rock it today. <laughs> maybe it would like bring back some memories of Grundvigs. Absolutely. Actually, <laughs> smells, I've, maybe. I've got the Carlsberg right here. <laughs> ah, of course. Uh, so they did some rebranding just like, yeah. just like we're doing right now, you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, so, wow. so how have you been these last like 10 years? How's everything going and how, how are, I mean, mandatory question, how are you doing throughout the, the pandemic in Copenhagen? Uh, well, which one should I start with? <laughs> oh, <laughs> like my Make... life in 10 years or uh, the pandemic Copenhagen, life? Copenhagen. Copenhagen, <laughs> yeah. The, the, Copenhagen. Late, I mean, the latest and we can move backwards. Okay, well, actually, I, I don't think I'm doing too bad in these uh, pandemic times. Uh, I don't know how if you're aware of the situation in Denmark because I know there are like all these local things about around the world mm -hmm. in in Denmark we have had a, a partial lockdown since I think I think it must have been November or December last year uh, so all stores have been closed all the schools have been closed ev almost everything has been closed um, since back then and now here last month uh, they started opening the schools again and a couple of weeks ago they started opening small shops uh, with a limited amount of customers uh, so life is like slowly getting back but like things like uh, uh, hairdressers and um, all sort of beauty treatments and other uh, private organizations are still closed like big uh, organizations are still closed uh, so we, it's, it's like baby steps like <laughs> like you yeah. said earlier yeah. Um, but you know you can still go grocery shopping and you can still go uh, yeah that's pretty much all you can do at the moment <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or you can start you can we have just my boyfriend and I have just returned our uh, our Christmas pre presents you know <laughs> so that was weird doing that <laughs> oh, in, gotcha. in like March <laughs> it's nice they, they extended the uh, return window yeah, we were a little worried about that, but it seemed like all the stores have just uh, agreed that, that they would do that. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, they they call them non-essential businesses for us, the ones that like don't really matter for like your basic needs. So like mm -hmm. groceries and whatnot are open. But so so what was like 
March 2020 to like November 2020 like because what you're describing happening a couple months ago happened to us for almost all of the year yeah it, it also started like that in the yeah in March last year uh, then there was a, a, a global not a global like what do you say a national lockdown uh, where everything closed just like in November and then during the summer period um, they opened everything up again because uh, the numbers were down so low it was actually uh, pretty well managed uh, in in the disease control so uh, they opened up in the in the summer and the numbers were good but then uh, going into autumn uh, with all the cold season and people being indoors uh, the numbers went up again and, and then they had to lock it all down and people were so pissed off and really angry and but it it's it seems to work because now their numbers are down again and that's why they're slowly opening up again so it's like yeah. it seems like the strategy is actually kind of helping now I've got, i'm wondering is that anger and like uh, disruption is that made into a political issue because that's a huge part of it over here yeah but it's it's in such a lame danish way i think <laughs> Because people are just really complaining a lot, I think, uh, that they, it's also turned, in the media, it's turned a lot towards these conspiracy theories that like, oh, we don't need to wear masks, uh, the virus is not really uh, that, uh, that dangerous, uh, okay. all these kind of things. So it's these things, uh, these kind of topics, they get attention in the media and that's mostly what the frustration is all about. And then also, the vaccine plan, uh, the plan of how we're going to vaccinate people has just changed. Uh, before they had a plan of, of uh, vaccinating people according to uh, what kind of risk group they were in, uh, but now they changed it to uh, being uh, age uh, regarded. Mm, okay. um, so yeah. they're vaccinating people in like age groups. Mm. Uh, so, so people are just mainly complaining about like little minor things, I think. And I'm personally, I'm just like happy that I have not gotten sick. I don't know anyone who's gotten sick, and I'm now kind of impressed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you haven't gotten sick. No, no we, we, we both, both we both got COVID. Uh, oh shit! <laughs> right, oh, right, one after the other. Actually, I think yeah. we were like a couple weeks apart or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you? How did? How was it? <laughs> It wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as, you know, other, as it could have been. Obviously, I didn't lose taste of, taste of smell, you know, sense of taste, touch. <laughs> I, I can touch sense things of still. Touch. <laughs> um, there you go. No, no, I was a little feverish for a couple of days, but it was really just a headache, like a weird underwater mm -hmm. feeling headache for like, a, even though like most other symptoms went away after a week for like a month, I had headaches, but it was not terrible. Mm. Oh, that's good. Pretty much the same for me as well. Yeah, I, I also, I mean, I think both of us were lucky. Neither of us got the uh, the bad cough or any of the breathing difficulties. Yeah, it was all kind of just like up up in here sort of. Um, although I recently took an antibody test and I took two actually, because I didn't believe the results and I have no antibodies. I believe so, it. Three months, they go away. Like hey, the science is still out there. So I don't know. I never actually tested right. positive. Um, it was just that I went, I went to a family gathering and it turned into a super spreader event that we uh, really should not have gone to. And everyone else tested positive. I felt sick. I assumed I have it. My girlfriend still is like half thinking maybe I made the whole thing up, but I didn't. I swear. It's, it was, it was a real a deal. Flu. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Very well. Very well could have been. But the weird thing is that I wasn't contagious. Like I had been hanging out with my sister for a whole weekend, two days before I started getting symptoms, which they claim is when you're the most. So I think because I wear a mask in public, um, it was just like a lower strain, not as effective. But. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> yes. got, we got lucky. I think we got lucky. And yeah. I got vaccinated because I'm a teacher. Ooh, nice. <laughs> and you got, is it two shots? Uh, yeah, I took more than two shots yesterday with my teacher friends. <laughs> to, um, <laughs> tie it into another round. But yes, two shots. I got the <laughs> Pfizer. <laughs> OK, so. You got both of them. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, Carl Marie, you gave us two excellent <laughs> film recommendations to so set funny us off. Call me Carl Marie. <laughs> wait. So wait. Do, <laughs> do you just go by Marie? Yes. <laughs> uh, but did Facebook. you used to go by Carl Marie, or did I, was... I just call you Carl Marie? I, I'm not sure. 
I thought it was you were in on the joke. <laughs> it was it was like my Facebook name back when we knew each other. <laughs> oh no, I was not so, in on. <laughs> yeah, inside joke, and you're on the outside. Dude. Yeah, that was. I mean, that, that that's been a, a common experience for for most of my life, I think. But you know, it's cool. <laughs> I'm good to know now. It's ne never too late. Never too late. All right, Marie. So <laughs> now, now that I know what to call you properly. Uh, you, we know we one one thing that was uh, great about my Grand Bigs experience is both of you guys introduced me to a very new world of film that I was used to. Lars von Trier, David Lynch were huge huge parts of that. So we uh, we followed up that legacy a little bit with two great. Man, I want to start with the Danish movies first, if that's okay with you guys. Before we do the movie talk, can we just do a little Grand Bigs talk first? Please, oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering, um, Marie, what was your opinion of me and David? Oh, wow, really? Yeah, going oh, straight. Okay. You're going straight at it. Mm, I'm not really sure. I I just I think I saw all of you uh, like the American exchange students as just like a group. <laughs> like yeah, you're right. just the Americans. Good, good. So you're like you're like one person to me. <laughs> you're not individuals. <laughs> no, I mean my my experience of you was was mainly and just positive. I just like to like get to know you guys, and I thought you were funny and and also very um, what do you say curious. You were always asking into like Danish culture. What is this about? And what is all this? And I just I just thought it was nice to share and also get to know like you and the American culture and stuff like that. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that the second part, I'm, I'm happy about the second part. The first part was definitely like the opposite of our intention doing, uh, you know, an immersive oh, I was, I was study. I sarcastic. Stay sarcastic. No, you're, yeah, again, I'm, I'm, I'm so slow. See, I see in, in Romania, it's a very, it's a different type of bluntness. You know, it's just the, the direct, you know, insults as, as, uh, as brutal as it gets. I need, I still need to re readjust, I think, culturally. It's why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to getting roasted yeah to get it to getting roasted uh but was that i'm curious was that your first um was that your first encounter with with uh, with americans socially or or academically uh academically <laughs> i guess we were kind of it was sort of it was academic. extracurricular <laughs> Extra there we go yeah well i uh, when i was back in i guess the equivalent is high school uh i was on a uh, kind of exchange journey to new york for a week Oh, really? uh, yeah, and then we met up with some American high school kids too, and uh, I actually got a little boyfriend over there for a couple of months. Like we were oh, long awesome. distance calling, <laughs> like back when I was sixteen. So I had a prior experience with Americans. Okay, in okay, that regard, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> All right, all right, sure. Interesting, interesting. And how did you end up in Grundvigs in the first place? Was it was it because of the like? Because you were doing you were doing a lot of photography stuff too when you were there, right? Yeah, I was. Um, it's uh, as you know, like uh, Grundvig is, is not really a, a school per se. It's this folk high school, so it's more right. like you get folk into <laughs> folk high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you get more like into sort of creative stuff and try to develop some of your yeah, creative and social skills, try to find a way in life uh, with, with all these subjects you can study there. Um, and I think just after uh, my high school years, I was unsure of which way to go um, and uh, wanted a gap year and thought that the Grunt Weeks was a good way to Yes, so try to go more into my hobbies, which were mostly creative stuff, uh, photography and painting. And I also did some theater stuff at the uh, Grundvigs. Um, so it was just like getting some new friends and trying out some of my more creative ho hobbies. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that's what it's all about there. Did, did you end up staying for the full year? Uh, no, I did not. Um, I was only there for what was it, four months? Yeah. Oh, okay. Once oh, so we left, what was the point yeah. of even staying? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was nothing, nothing good there anymore. <laughs> now, is it is it true that like um, law enforcement are required to live in a folk high school before they do that? I feel like that was a fact. Oh. Uh, so weird. Because we had that, we had all those no. cadets 
or yeah, Chinese. Yeah, that's right. I that's right. I actually forgot about that. There was this group of yeah police guys. I I don't think it's mandatory at all. I just think it was maybe a, a subject they could choose, maybe to go there and and get get some some more skills or something. Right. <laughs> but right. I don't think it's mandatory. Okay. as part of because i yeah because i know a guy right now who is studying to become a police officer and he's not going to any mm, kind okay. of uh, uh, folk high school <laughs> well it, it's it's still related too because i mean as you as uh, i'm sure you're aware we, we've had a lot of huge societal wide issues in america revolving around police and i think a, a big part of it is maybe lack of training too so i mean with with your friend in police academy and just in denmark in general what are some of the huge differences that you notice like right off the bat between how, you know, I mean, I think, I think the average American police officer gets like 13 weeks or something of, you know, three months of, of training. Of training. Denmark is quite, quite a bit different, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure my friend here, he has to study for three years or something. Yeah. Uh, wow. And yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure what his subjects are, what they're doing. I think it's a lot of practical work also being like out with uh, trained, officers and and trying stuff out um, right, and right. just watching and learning but they also have like school time where they are i guess they're getting into all sorts of criminology and, and stuff like that sure sure i've got to wonder in um moments of crisis in like denmark is it just police that are sent to situations or do you have more like mental health professionals or like a wide because a big issue here was that like cops use force in situations when that's not necessarily what should be done uh, are you thinking about the pandemic here, David? No, no. I think no. I think he meant more like issues, like like domestic disturbances and stuff. A, a lot of the times when people end up being killed by the police, I think Walter's saying is there's a lot of those situations probably could have been managed by someone like a well-trained public uh, social worker who just goes and talks them through and maybe recommends, you know, I don't know, hospitalization or something. But but something that doesn't involve guns, really. Oh yeah, uh, well, yeah. Um, I, I think it depends on the situation. I think if there's a house disturbance in, of any kind, the, the police is probably the first one people call. But I think the uh, Danish police uh, uh, police officers are pretty well trained in de-escalating a situation and trying to calm people down instead of uh, like drawing the gun. That's not really the custom in Denmark. I what think a world. It's, it's a lot about uh, dialogue and trying to figuring out the situation. <laughs> There's. Do you, do you remember when we were when we were all at Grunvigs together? There was a parliamentary debate held in Grunvigs. Nope. No. Nope. All right. Fine. Well, you both were there. I I I, I, I okay. remember both of you guys being there because I I felt I. But felt were we mentally it. there? Maybe, the maybe not. Maybe. Not. Yeah, we might have been coming back from Christianity or something that day. I don't know. But <laughs> but we. Uh, but you know that the the big thing there was uh, Denmark's first female prime minister was elected while we were in Denmark. Though that, that was those elections in September October of 20, 2011. But yeah. I I have watched a few documentaries in preparation for this interview, of course, about you know some remaining issues like you know I, I was watching a thing about last year's election and uh, a lot of debate in in Denmark about the ghetto bill or the ghetto legislation and interviews with Danes who, who might not be from Denmark originally, who might still be struggling to, to integrate and whatnot. Is, are there, is that still a big debate in Denmark or has the pandemic overshadowed a lot of that? Or like, where, where, where is Denmark kind of in terms of some problems that may, maybe we started to see the early hints of with like the, the, uh, uh day f f now what the, the danish people's party yeah 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 um i think in the media right now the pandemic takes most of most of the time but uh immigrant issues and ghetto issues uh, is always a hot topic uh, because it mm. divides the nation and i think uh, the Danish People's Party is is uh, actually uh, at this year or last year's election uh, two other parties that had like immigrant issues uh, as their primary case uh, um, they they came up and and mm. actually got pretty popular uh, which was kind of disturbing uh, yeah. so it's still a thing that's going on um, I don't know if you've heard about uh, this Danish guy he was very discussed during this last election uh, he's called Rasmus Pelodan 
Oh, the guy who burns the Qurans, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He he formed his own party and he uh, tried to get elected for uh, what the for the parliament or what you call it. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, he was very popular among kids before before uh, uh, he got into politics because he was this crazy weird guy who burned the Quran and and standing mm -hmm. and was shouting uh, racist mm -hmm. comments comments on the internet. Um, but. Yeah, it was it was a really weird election because he was standing there amongst other like real politicians, and he just looked like an idiot. <laughs> but it, but it really raised a lot of questions about like how far can we go with these kind of political comments? How how mm. how rude can we be? Because he was just being so rude and uh, probably like what do you say provoking? Provocative. So, yeah. Yeah, provocative. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is actually a good time to move on to Flickering Lights because I watched it last <laughs> night and I loved this movie. It was an amazing recommendation. And I got to say, what a way to bookend Mads Mikkelsen's career by starting with Flickering Lights. And then just an hour ago, I finished another round. So it was very, it was oh. perfect. Uh, it was, yeah, a perfect evolution there, I think. But I did Flickering Lights two nights ago and then another round last night. So it's a great way to start my spring break. And I went, drink I went drinking with my teacher friends after school yesterday and then watched this and was like, yep, I miss Denmark. <laughs> you miss Denmark. It's the Danish <laughs> drinking culture. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Everyone gets yeah. drunk. Um, how accurate, I guess, was your high school experience compared to the ones the students had, like the lake run stuff? Uh, Oh, well, I think I'm a really bad example because I don't remember if you guys remember that I didn't drink at Grundvigs. I, I didn't start drinking oh, until really? I was like, yeah, I, I never drank at the parties we had at Grundvigs. Uh, I was always so. I think we were too <laughs> drunk to notice. Yep, yep, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a lot of, uh, actually the funny thing was a lot of uh, the Danish people there, they noticed and they were like, why are you not drinking? I, it's so fun, come be with us. And I was like, no, no thanks. <laughs> Um, uh, okay. So, so it is not uh, very equivalent to those people in the movie, <laughs> in my case. But I think generally it's a very accurate picture of of the the Danish youth and how they they start drinking actually from a very early age. I remember people in my uh, like I'm actually not sure what grade it was. Maybe in the in sixth or seventh grade. Like a lot of my. Uh, uh, the pupils at school were 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 drinking in wow. the weekends, wow. like from maybe even from Thursday through to a Sunday. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And were they like sneaking it, or were their parents like, yeah, just do it at the house? Um, I'm I'm not sure, um, okay. but I think a lot of Danish families are actually very uh, accepting of it and being like, yeah, we can drink together. It's that it, you learn this from home. Like, uh, mm. oh, here's your first beer. You're old enough to drink. You can, we can try <laughs> try this out together. Yes. And did you did you go to high school in Copenhagen or are you from from more of the countryside? Uh, I'm from Copenhagen. Okay. Okay. And I'm still here. <laughs> I never moved on. Hey, fair, fair enough, fair enough. I, I think Walter and I are both very envious uh, <laughs> for, for a, a lot of reasons of just of, of living in Denmark in general. Um, I, I was, it was, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was an yeah, amazing we, experience. We, we took a lot of our, um, I feel like we tried to incorporate the way we felt into our, when we were there, into the, like the last decade of our lives, mainly yeah. oh, really? trying to be hoogie. <laughs> yeah. Hugo. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I was thinking about about Hugo. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. All right, one one more time, Marie. One more time. How about us? Hugo. 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 Okay. Hugo. Hugo. So I noticed, and and tell me if I'm wrong here, but I counted at least two uh, Hugo quoted moments in Flickering Lights, and both of them, if I remember correctly, were when Ulrich uh, Thompson's character was like lying shot on the couch first thinking that he was kind of like in a semi-dying state and he was just saying i want huga right basically oh and yeah like, yeah yeah yeah. and that was part of their rationale for like staying in the cabin right or not the cabin the that that house that ends up turning into the, the beautiful restaurant so yeah i mean it was uh i felt that there was a real message there of rewarding those that stay you know and i i thought that that mm. was awesome yeah, they also have like the they are this little group of of uh, what do you say, 
like they're outside of society they they all have this very miserable background and then they find uh what is the word like when uh, you're together as a group <laughs> they find oh, cohesion bonding i yeah, don't know yeah bond they're bonding Tra like, trauma bonding is the term I yeah, trauma. Use, which is you find <laughs> someone who has the same like horrible past and then you can relate and connect so yeah, yeah. And yeah. I actually thought about something because uh, I realized, or thinking earlier, uh, that there are actually some very Danish moments in this movie that I realized that you would not understand. Ooh, <laughs> uh, let's hear um, it. please. Uh, well, um, there is uh, there was the scene where um, what's he in the movie? He's called Stefan. Um, he's reading out the poem "Flickering Lights." Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you, they ask him, "Oh, who wrote this poem?" And he looks on the cover of the book, which has been eaten by mice. And right. he says, it's Ove Ditlevsen. And then they're all like, oh yeah, it's such a great poet. He's such a good guy. And the funny thing is that um, <laughs> the poet is not called Ove Ditlevsen. It's a woman and she's called Tove Ditlevsen. And uh. apparently these guys are so uncultural that they have, <laughs> they, they don't remember her real name and they think it's a guy. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. I just realized that you would actually miss this joke because you don't totally. know this poet. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Game changer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's why, because I thought, oh, how would you guys actually see this scene? You would probably see like really touching, and he's sitting there crying because oh, he's being so moved by this poem. But it's so yep. hilarious because they're <laughs> they have no idea that the real poet is Tove, and all Danish people know this. You're like, uh, oh my god, how can you not know this? This poet is is so known. You know that. Right, right. Yeah, I remember like thinking in my head when that scene started, like, okay, there might be some like things we don't pick up automatically because yeah. it's a different culture, but it's a joke. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, but I just realized that, and I, I can't really remember if there are other scenes like that in the movie, but that one exactly, I just thought you would probably not get it. <laughs> yeah. I loved, I mean, I, I've got to say, I was thinking about um, In Bruges during the movie. It felt like it was following a similar structure to that film, in that that is about um, a couple hitmen who like run away to a place where they're hiding from, and, and you're waiting for like the gangster to come and have this big moment at the end. And so what are we talking about? It's in called Bruges. In Bruges. Colin okay. Farrell. Pretty good, pretty good. It's a beautiful movie by a, a Scottish uh, writer director. And it's in Bruges, Belgium. I actually spent three days during my, my break when we were abroad, I spent three days in Bruges because of the film. And it's it's a, a fairy tale fucking village, as they say in the movie. Um, but similar to that film, I won't I won't spoil what I'm talking about, but like in flickering light, I just loved the payoff of the conversation that Mads has with the hunter when he's like, I've, I've never had to kill a human because I've never like had a reason to. And then you have <laughs> such an epic conclusion. Out. Yeah. 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 Oh, but yeah. there are just so many lovable characters in that movie too. I think it's a very char character-driven movie because they're all so weird and fucked up. And also, uh, the doctor who's just <laughs> walking around drunk all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's just hilarious. He's like, oh, new friends. Let's, let's yeah. hang out. But I just thought you should see that movie because there are so many like one-liners from that movie that a lot of Danes, they just they have started just saying it in everyday conversations. Wow. Right. Um, yeah, especially like... Uh, the scene where Ulrich Thompson, he's, uh, he's, um, what do you say, withdrawing from, uh, from his cocaine yeah. addiction. Yeah. And he's mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I need this. I need this coke. Like people say it all the time about all sorts of things. Like, I need this. I need this. Like in, in his voice, <laughs> this becomes <laughs> like a Danish thing. <laughs> nice. There are a lot uh, of lines like that from the movie that people just use. <laughs> yeah. It feels like almost like a Quentin Tarantino movie, at least culturally speaking. Mm. Like, mm -hmm. like, because I kind of was thinking about Reservoir Dogs also during it, like the guy that's shot like throughout. You know, because Tim Roth's character is bleeding, bleeding out during it because he shot yeah, it. Yeah, but the scene is so embarrassing. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> no, I worries. loved in that scene with the with you know, while he was going through withdrawal when like the camera like zoomed in really close to the window and then like zoomed out at a completely different time of day. It was there was some very interesting uh, techniques they used. Yeah, and and I think that's also what I really like about the movie because it balances the humor and then the the seriousness of their trauma really well. Yeah. And uh, the guys who made this movie, they also made, I think, three or four other movies that are very similar to this one in, in the tone. Like it's it's uh, humorous and being and serious, like at the same time. Uh, Adam's apples, very, right? 
Yeah, exactly. Like it's some kind of existential questions uh, being like carried out in a very yeah. light and 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 good way. <laughs> and I'd say another round kind of touched on that as well with the totally. Kierkegaard uh, anxiety speech they gave and. Oh. Um, that was a great scene. Powerful. So yeah. yeah, everyone check out Flickering Lights if you haven't seen it. It's on Amazon Prime. I bought it for two bucks just so I could rewatch it when I don't have Prime. But um, a great film. Mads Mikkelsen, not not at the heights of his powers yet, but definitely mm -hmm. like giving it all. Oh, he really gave it all. Yeah, I mean, it was, that was an incredible character. Yeah, it's also really funny, I thought, um, because I guess you guys as Americans know him from, from more international movies like... Uh, like the James Bond, James Bond. and the uh, Hannibal and and stuff right. like that, but uh, in 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 Denmark you you know him as this goofy kind of guy. He's played in a lot of these movies where he's he has like uh, stupid characters. Yeah, and uh, Men and yeah. Chicken is that one? I haven't seen it yet, but I, yeah, at least that's the same uh, that's the same guys who made Flickering Lights, uh, both that fair. and Adam's Apples. And uh, there's always called. I don't know if the English title is this, but in Danish called the, the Green Butchers. And he also has this really lame character who's like a really strict guy who always does things right. And he's uh, bald and he sweats yeah. a lot. So, <laughs> so he's been called uh, Sven, isn't it his name? And then he called Sven Sweat. <laughs> Fantastic. <Yeah. laughs> My sister made the point yesterday. It must be interesting to be like the only international star from your country. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's also like he's our own, uh, our only export. <laughs> That's all hey, you got Viggo Mortensen, isn't he half Danish? Yeah, but my impression is that he's he's actually not been in any Danish movies. He's only uh, been in international mm. things. Uh, whereas Mads Mikkelsen has a very Danish career right. too, uh, where we know him. But and Viggo serious Mortensen roles has... too. I mean, I was thinking about yeah. like uh, two of my favorite movies with him are The Hunt and After the Wedding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those are, those sure, are both uh, great. Super serious. Yeah, The Hunt yeah. is... Actually, I can't remember, was it nominated for an Oscar back then? It was, it oh, was. Yeah, uh, it was nominated. I know that's by the same director of Another Round, I believe. Uh, yeah, yeah my, my Tom yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And this, I mean, Another Round, the, one of the biggest, I'd say the biggest surprise of this year's Oscar nominations was that Another Round got, direct, got nominated for Best Director. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I actually didn't know they could do that. <laughs> it is rare, I think. Yeah. Like I know Guillermo del Toro got one for Pan's sure. Labyrinth, but typically yeah. it's not the case. A Parasite, of course, one also. Parasite mm -hmm. one for yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, well deserved, I would say. Mm -hmm. Fantastic film. Great message. Great message. Wear your life vest. That's the message. Wear your life vest. Yeah, on the boat. You know, okay. where the. <laughs> um, yeah, the gym okay. teacher did not wear his life vest. That's <laughs> right, Zap, <Seth>, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, been a while since I watched it. I think the message I took from it was more like, uh, it's, uh, don't, don't live your life like a teenager. <laughs> yeah, I was time. thinking, <laughs> don't live life to the extreme. Don't, mm. don't be sober and don't black out. Like, yeah, right, it was actually right. a little... Point zero five percent. How how did you guys interpret the ending? Because my my boyfriend and I, when we watched it, we were we weren't really sure how to interpret his running around in circles back in the end. It was a like a bit manic, right? You talking about the dancing? Yeah, his dancing scene. <laughs> I mean, it, it, they had been bringing up that he was a great dancer and he was too sad to do it throughout the movie, but then he found his perfect level of drunk, I guess, where he could like half dance and half like fall all over the place. Yeah, but I wasn't sure if he was like balancing it or was he just going back to full on being a teenager because he's just texted his wife and like, oh, maybe there was something like going back to the family life, going back to right, the routine. Right. But on the other side, he was dancing around and being like with the drunk kids again. I, I don't know. My interpretation was he's going back more towards the teenage years because it seemed like the problems with his marriage were before the drinking started, really. And it was only that the drinking, the worst episode is what then convinces his wife to be forthcoming about the affair and then and then that's what breaks them up or or at least his like distant behavior before so i'm interpreting it as like the relationship is saved but now he's an alcoholic <laughs> <laughs> but now he's an alcoholic right right he embraces yeah, the tragedy maybe. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It could be, it could be. One interesting point my, my sister actually brought up was that the one teacher who was an alcoholic, where it was too much for him, was the gym teacher, mm. whereas the other teachers were all in the humanities. They were all like thinkers and like be, mm. their, their drinking kind of helped their teaching style. I mean, it helped all of them to an extent, but for him, he, it was like, I don't know, that's a point. Oh, yeah, I, I actually didn't, didn't think about this myself, but yeah, maybe that's mm, like a creative thought that the director had that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that the gym teacher doesn't yeah. have the, the academics to, to get uh, anything out of this experiment, but it, it's not yeah. a, something I, I realized myself, but um, it could be an interpretation. I loved that, like, it almost felt like they put a filter on a couple scenes, or like the camera became just like more sweeping when they were slightly drunk, and it was mm. like, like the way that the soccer match was shot so beautifully, or like his teaching when he's like such an active teacher, like, it was, it was, it was subtle, but really well done, I thought. Yeah. I, I don't remember that many details about it. I think I watched it last summer. Yeah. Back when, when the, the movie theaters were open, mm -hmm. I, I watched it back then. So it's been a while since I watched it. I only remember like a big picture. <laughs> I just remembered that the, the movie, The Clown was in theaters when we were in Denmark, based on the television show, The Clown. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I showed that at my film club in college to um, mixed reception. Okay. I just remember there's some uh, jokes about like, uh, you know, a, a child and uh, being in an uncompromising situation that is not as socially acceptable. Definitely now, but even a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And I was yeah. just like, it, it's, it's a cultural thing. Um, <laughs> don't play, this is not like my thing. No, I, I think uh, actually specifically the clown, uh, both the movie and the TV show also divided a lot of Danish people. Mm. Um, not because I think it was like like groundbreaking in, in taking up uh, sore topics or stuff like that, but more mm. that it was so embarrassing. Like people, Danish people thought it was too embarrassing to watch like that this main character is always putting himself in situations yeah. where he's totally out of reach and <laughs> not in sync with what people around him are thinking. So yeah, uh, a that's mostly... with, it's like cringy humor is what yeah, very here. cringy. And, um, curb your enthusiasm with a lot of like comparisons or like Seinfeld, just like mm. um, taking pleasure in other people's uncomfortability, which is yeah. definitely divisive. Yeah. Now with with think, this with this yeah. alcoholic stuff though, like did you feel like did you feel like you you became an alcoholic during the d during the pandemic? Because that that's been something that we've <laughs> talked about a lot on this on this podcast. Uh, you may, maybe like some ways that we kind of relate to these guys, but maybe more <laughs> sad with us. I don't know. I would say actually the opposite because since everything is shut down and uh, like my seeing my friends and stuff has been very limited. And mm. there are no parties, there's no reason to drink. Yeah. So I've actually been more sober than ever in, within these last like seven years or something. Because I, wow. I started drinking back when That's I was great. 19 or something. And then yeah. I've had a couple of years of uh, being out partying drunk too. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, then it's just like, like <laughs> reduced itself very slowly. Okay, so Danish oh. model of good health. <laughs> way, way to go, yeah. Marie. <laughs> so you're not an alcoholic. Yeah. That's great. No, um, no, I wouldn't say. Well, but according I, yeah. according to the National Institute of Alcohol and Alcoholism, uh, two thirds of American of the American population drink, and of that group, twenty five percent of them binge drink. Mm. So that means more than five drinks in two hours for men, and four drinks for two hours for women. Um, oh, wow! Yeah, and they started. In two I think. Hours. Oh yeah. yeah, like every half that hour. Sounds like yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Like Sounds like different. a regular out night uh, night out for a Danish person. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I remember. <laughs> yeah. I think it's more morning. common for for Danish people to like binge drink when they're out partying and having fun or having a, a, like Christmas lunch or stuff like that. Like they drink a lot. It's not just for the pleasure of it. Mm. It's very integrated into the Danish society that we drink to get drunk so we can talk to each other. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but not not on the not on the train of the metro though. Uh no, I think it's not allowed. <laughs> oh no, I just meant like anyway. still still not talking to each other on the train of the metro, like even oh, in front of oh. maybe. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Um, that's but that's the thing about Danish people, they're so shy. We don't talk to each other at all out in public. Yeah. And that's why we have to drink to like loosen up and get social. Mm. 
yeah, that stuck with me and it shouldn't have. That was one bad thing I think I picked up. Um, you became shy after Denmark. I drank more after Denmark. Mm. That's for sure. Okay. Um, I actually, in uh, relation to the movie, I, I remember watching it last summer and it had been a while since I've been at any parties and watching the movie actually made me feel like I wanted to get drunk again. <laughs> it, it gave me this like feeling of, ah, oh, I really miss partying and I really miss like, like getting loose and, and yeah. yeah, dancing and having fun with my friends. So I know. It, That's, it, it was, it, especially at the beginning of the quarantine, watching movies where people are more than six feet apart or touching each other, like, yeah. it's mind blowing. Like, this yeah. is a different world right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I will say it's changing, at least uh, for those who are vaccinated just a bit. So, right, right. We're getting there. We're getting there. Trend. Hopefully. <laughs> but hey, there was one one other thing that all three of us have in common with uh, the characters of uh, another round are we are all or have been teachers. So that's oh. that's another thing. And so you you are you're teaching right now, right? You mean? Yeah. Yeah, I I just got a job uh, in February. Uh, I just finished my master's degree and uh, I got a job at the School Congrats. of uh, Physiotherapy and Occupational Therapy. Oh, cool. Congratulations. Oh, Thank really you. Cool. So I teach uh, psychology, sociology, and then um, like uh, training, like uh, what do you say? Physical training. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Physical okay. therapy, maybe. Yeah. I teach Part psychology too. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm working with uh, high schoolers mainly um, oh. at a therapeutic school in Manhattan. So every student has either learning or um, emotional uh, differences. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Really correct term. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, so like some of my students are like, why would I learn about this? This is what I, the life I live right now. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> It's interesting though. I love to. What what uh, sociology and psychology classes are you teaching? Well, they're just called sociology and psychology classes. It's um, since it's it's the school of uh, occupational and physical therapy. So it's people who are going to work with people and are going to teach uh, how to have a healthy life and how to uh, repair their bodies. So my teaching is mainly focused around. Uh, teaching them how to be around people and being around people with with uh, issues maybe like uh, mental issues uh, but mostly like being a professional in a in a health uh, system uh, how do you deal with working with people in crisis and uh, with people with uh, like physical um, disturbances mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah 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 absolutely so it's more like a practical approach to how to be a health professional without being a dick <laughs> like yeah, yeah, and yeah don't be a dick to watch your clients that's basically what that's, i try to tell people <laughs> that's a good attitude i think that's a pretty that's a pretty good start i think a lot of countries yeah. could learn from <laughs> yeah like try to be empathic and uh, show some interest in the person who's telling you about their broken arm <laughs> right their anger doesn't come from a place of anger it comes from a place of pain yeah exactly <laughs> That is extraordinarily progressive, and I mean, I I wonder how how closely that ties in with Denmark's continued status as one of the top three to top five happiest countries in the world. That was certainly my quest when I was in Denmark was to try to figure out the why of it. But I I, I don't know. I found that there was just a it was really a Pandora's box, a positive Pandora's box of like not there was no one reason. There was like maybe a thousand reasons. You know, it seems like that's yeah. one of them. Yeah, but we've we've gone down the list of the yeah. We, you guys were number one when we were there. Yeah, then yeah. I guess it's three to five. The happiest year. <laughs> yeah, the happiest year. Yeah, Cheers. but I Skull. but I think uh, like the recent countries that has gotten that title. That's also like other Scandinavian countries. It's Finland it? this year. Yeah, Finland got yeah. it this year. Yeah, Ooh. and and. The earlier it was Norway, I think. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, so I don't. I I think maybe it might have something to do with like the welfare system and mm. uh, how we are supported when when things go bad. There's always something to catch us. So yeah. we're not entirely on our own. There's a system that's always supporting you when you're when you are in need. Mm. Even though a lot of people are complaining that oh, when you're out of job, you don't get enough money, or oh, the healthcare system doesn't work entirely smooth, but but still, there is some kind of basis that is pretty decent. 
Yeah. And I think that's maybe part of why we're pretty yeah. happy. Yeah. I mean, positive psychology was my core course when I was there. And mm. that's how what we were taught. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. the, everything you give, you, you expect to give half of your money to the government as a result, you're going to get education, you're going to get help. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, I think most people are very happy to pay their taxes here, even though they're much higher than yours. Uh, I mean, I, I pay 46% here in Romania, oh. um, and I do not get what you get out of that. Because you're time. experiencing wanderlust, David. Right, right. Yeah, no, that, that's true. That's true. That, that's, that's a whole, a whole, a whole separate topic. But I mean, we have, it's, I, I think maybe one of the reasons why uh, a country like Romania, which has the theoretically a similar social welfare structure practically has very sad people. And I think a big reason for that is that we have huge amounts of corruption. So um, yes, I get free healthcare, but is it anywhere close to Danish healthcare? Like, no, no, it's not. There's um, another movie that got nominated for two Oscars this year is a Romanian film called Collective about a horrendous scandal here involving the medical system and particularly it was about a fire at a nightclub and how most of the victims died long, days after from infections from the hospital because it turned out they were diluting the um the the sanitizer in order to like cut an extra check to a mayor somewhere or you know the hospital oh. group you know gets a new lamborghini um so it's if you have that system and it doesn't work as well as it does in Denmark, it could be a bit of a disaster like here. I guess. As soon as corruption gets into the picture, it, yeah. it ruins everything. Yeah. Totally. No matter what you're doing. Totally, yeah, yeah. Now, was that a documentary, David? That, like, it was nominated for Best Documentary as well as Foreign Film? It was nominated for, yes, exactly, yeah. I think that's like one of the first foreign documentaries to be nominated as well. For, like, for Best Foreign Film as well as Documentary? Right. I would check that out. That sounds interesting. Uh, yeah, it's dark. It's a, it's a dark film. Um, but hey, after watching Lost Highway, you know, maybe it's appropriate. <laughs> maybe it's appropriate. Yeah. Oh, that was dark. Yeah. And gloomy. It was, right? Yeah. It yeah. was lost. It was very lost. It, it was lost. It was lost. I was lost after watching it. <laughs> was that your first time seeing it? Yes, it was. Uh, I watched uh, uh, some other David Lynch movies and I watched uh, Twin Peaks and I'm mm -hmm. actually I consider myself a little bit of a David Lynch fan uh, I, I usually have a, a good relationship with him but <laughs> but this one was a little frustrating I thought mm -hmm. and I also thought it it, it had a very a lot of similarities um, and intertextual references to Twin Peaks and to Mulholland Drive <laughs> so I was like yeah. this is kind of a rewatch but then not really <laughs> I know not, very much in the 90s he had he was set in his ways thematically and visually and that's even the new season of Twin Peaks too feels more like Lost Highway than anything else yeah did you watch the third season of Twin Peaks yeah I did and I actually want to rewatch it soon uh, because it was <laughs> it was uh i didn't think i i grasped, grasped hey, everything we'll, we'll start a spin-off podcast where we watch an episode and talk about it every week sounds good uh, that sounds perfect that sounds perfect <laughs> I'm, I'm all in i actually i remember there was a there was a youtube series that like interpreted every episode of the third season and i had to watch that every time to like see if oh, i could just wrap my head around it i watched like six of those every week and on repeat <laughs> and like i was so <laughs> deeply ingrained as you can see from my tie yeah <laughs> But I know you're a huge David Lynch fan. I have seen your Facebook picture shaking his hand and everything. <laughs> the happiest I will have ever been. <laughs> Except for being Grundvix. Those are up there, definitely. Yeah. Top two, top two. <laughs> they say never meet your heroes, but they're wrong. Cause... But why, why are you such a David Lynch fanboy, I'm wondering? Why? Um, why? <laughs> uh, I because, guess... I mean, I feel like I like him and it's great, but, but you really seem to be fanboying. I guess I need to go to therapy before I, to understand mm. why. But I think <laughs> I think it's just his way of having childhood. His like his protagonist having like childhood innocence, mainly Dale Cooper, and and even like his character in Blue Velvet. Yeah. Like just going into the world with optimism, but the world being such a cruel and depraved place. Like and like mm. just the the weirdness of the world and the, the beauty that comes from the horror. And Just like Dune. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know about that. 
Sorry. <laughs> um, were you there when we when we screamed Dune at Brown Figs? There was a fire involved. Um, no, I think I remember something about fire, but I don't think I watched the movie at Grunvik's. Okay. I think I watched it years later, actually, for the first time. I didn't like it that much. I thought it was weird. <laughs> no, yeah. this is worse. Yeah. Film. You're it's not a, hands down. It's worse. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I just think that Lynch does things. I'm I'm always surprised by the choices he makes, even though they seem to be a little bit repetitive. They they always. I always get why he's being. I don't think he's being weird for the sake of being weird, and I think everyone holds that against him and says it is why. Yeah, I think I agree on that, and I, that's also what makes me still kind of like him because it doesn't seem um, what do you say uh, uh, like like a coincidence what what he makes. There's really a lot of thought behind all the scenes and all the um, small details in in his movies. So that's also what makes him kind of interesting, even though it's a little bit repetitive. And also, yeah. I think it's nice that he he also kind of has a trademark like. You you can always tell when it's a David Lynch movie because mm -hmm. he just leaves you with this really eerie, weird feeling like, oh, am I in a dream? What's going on? <laughs> and I think that's and that's actually really impressive that you can capture that on film. I've not seen this in any other movies uh, that great. you can that you really get into this dreamlike state. And I, I'm mm. this yeah. is kind of stupid, but I'm a fan of dreams. I, I have dreams every night and I love it. <laughs> and yeah. it's kind of funny to get a, a glimpse into someone else's dreams where it's, yeah. everything is very incohesive and, and and just weird incohesive totally it's like a psychogenic fugue where you just go into a state where like you're not sure if it's reality if it's weird and yeah. i feel like that like so many directors who try to be dreamlike in their in their filming like come off as cheesy or like a little like i don't know i'm thinking like Michelle Gondry or something like he did um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind mm. or The Science of Sleep like I like those I think those are like different types of dreams just not necessarily the ones that I have I don't have like uh, I don't fly in my dreams that's a shame it's a great <laughs> feeling Is me neither you fly <laughs> yeah. in your dreams yeah I do not not oh. every time but every once in a while I, I, Sweet. I take a little take a little fly <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I, I was thinking too about just like the dream state of David Lynch. I felt that with another Danish director, actually, whose name I'm going to butcher, Nicholas Winding Reffen. Uh, Reffen? Uh, Am I saying it right? And Nicholas Winding Reffen. Yes. Yeah. And especially, especially in there, there was we we watched Drive. I think I think you were both there. I, I, for for sure, Walter introduced me to Drive in Grunvig's. I think it had just come out that summer, mm -hmm. and that was kind of a dream state. But there was this other one he did that was kind of a follow up called Only God Forgives. Did you see that one, Marie? And it takes I, place. I've in... seen uh, neither of those two. Actually. Oh. What? Uh, yes. Oh my God! Because these oh are like I think they're. Have it's you the seen same any vibe. of these films? It's the it same was... vibe. Have you seen anything he's done? The Neon Demon or the yeah, Hollow right. Hollow Rising with Mads Mikkelsen? Yeah, Madison? I've seen uh, the Neon Demon. Uh, That's my favorite of his films. I love. I listen to that music all the time. It's yeah, it's a really good soundtrack. Clive Martinez, right? Cliff. Cliff, Cliff Martinez. Martinez. <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite working composer these days. He does beautiful. He was actually a drummer for the Red Hot Chili Peppers in like the early nineties. <laughs> wow. Yeah, now he's like the the king of like synth. Yeah, wave. super synth. All, all of those movies were were synth as fuck. I I haven't seen the Neon Demon, but I got the vibe that 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 Wait, is as well. What? No, I ha I haven't seen that Damn one it. yet. All right. Well, Marie, you've got to watch Drive and Only God Forgives, and I'll watch the Neon Demon. We, we can. You don't have do to watch Only God Forgives. Just I have so many movies to catch up on. Like my boyfriend hates me for every time he mentions like like just uh, basic movies and i'm like no i haven't seen it <laughs> like he had to show me godfather the other day and i was like uh, yeah sure <laughs> let's watch it all right did you david like does it a great david does a great godfather impression uh wait no i gotta like if i hear wait let me try again if i if not i'm not gonna <laughs> <laughs> next time next time cut them all. <laughs> no, but I, I will say lost highway is it's not my favorite lynch it's like the side of lynch that is the hardest to get into because it's so like 
meth energy like <laughs> meth like energy. yeah it's like Crystal just the idea meth. of like going like insane and losing your sense of self like to the point of like wanting to listen to death metal and like mm. bash them in brains in like yeah actually which it was a very related. it was also a very musical movie like there are a lot of uh, good songs in it and i was like yeah and then oh. they stopped like midway and i was like no i wouldn't listen to this uh, Marilyn <laughs> manson song <laughs> it's one of the best soundtracks of the 90s i think yeah um, because it's like also the type of music that isn't usually in film like at least at the time i mean it's like you get your, your nine inch nails and some Marilyn manson going on mm. a weird a like 90s bowie song to open the credits david bowie is it david bowie song the, the first one Mm -hmm. The opening oh. credits, the I'm Deranged song is by him. Oh, I yeah. really like that one. I gotta check it out. So, and, and if you guys don't have any more Lost Highway thoughts, I would like to do a bit of a Denmark blitz round, if you will. <laughs> can, we, can, we, can we dive in? Can we dive in here? Yeah, All right, so host. <laughs> most of our listeners uh, have never been in Denmark understandably and you know part of part of our thinking with this with this podcast allowing people like like kind of get get a glimpse into a country right and so for i i think everyone is you know most travelers are familiar with kind of like the top danish sites that people you know people show up in copenhagen for 48 hours they go to tivoli gardens and they see the the little mermaid statue but what is a place that i've so for us i mean we were there for four months but i feel like there's a million things i didn't see what would be like, say, the top three recommendations you would give for visitors that want to see a true Denmark that is off the beaten path and not the kind of place we're going to run to tourists? And hopefully by saying it, we're not ruining those places by then, exposing them oh, to, to tourists. That's, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, because, uh, I, I mean, I live in, in Copenhagen myself, so I, I know uh, Copenhagen also as a tourist city I also I worked actually for uh, five years at the Rosenborg Castle in in the middle of Copenhagen which is a huge tourist attraction yeah. so I, I used to give out recommendations for for tourists quite a lot but it was it was mostly the basic stuff because Copenhagen isn't really that big of a city mm -hmm. um, sure. it's you can you can walk through it if like from one end to the other like in one day if if you're still in the main city um, so yeah. you can pretty much get to see all the major tourist attractions within a within a weekend or something like that. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. If you stay in Copenhagen, but then you can of course you can go like around the country if you have time for that. I mean, if you go to uh, Hillerød where where Grund Grundtvig High School was, I think the castle up there, uh, what is it called? Frederiksberg. Yeah, Frederiksberg is the uh, best one. Is the best one. Yeah, for <laughs> actually. Sure. Yeah, because it's actually a much bigger scale version of the Rosenborg forecast, which made in the same time period. Um, and I just think it's amazing. It's like going into like a little fairy tale castle, <laughs> and yeah. there's a yeah. huge garden surrounding it that's really really pretty. Um, there was scaffolding surrounding it when we were there, which we took oh. advantage of. We climbed to the top of the castle, Marie. <laughs> what? Yeah, we climbed oh to God. the actual not not the top. We climbed like to the the, the the top center. The top, the the center top, not the towers, but yeah, we got up about uh, probably a good uh, thirty meters there, I'd say. Oh, that sounds really dangerous. <laughs> it was. It was probably three a.m. on a Saturday, but it was well worth. It was <laughs> before the Danes arrived, right? Or like it was like our orientation weekend. It might have been. It was pretty early. It was pretty early. Yeah. Were you drunk during during this time? <laughs> not. Shit not crazy <laughs> I, I, enough probably that 0. 0.05 enough to have the confidence to do new things like climb castles you know oh i i gotta see those images i need to see this <laughs> yeah i'm not sure if there's any photographic evidence but i'll i'll i'll, I'll dig around i'll dig around and, and see what i can find but what is what is your favorite place in copenhagen because you you probably saw copenhagen in, a, in probably a new light at post grundvigs right like kind of seeing it now at like 18 or 19 instead of as a as like a high school student like what are some of the places that that you really got to know and love in Copenhagen that like tourists aren't going to? Oh, that's a good question. I'm I'm not really sure. It's also because like during the pandemic, I I haven't been getting out that much. I haven't. Yeah, totally. I my usual routine is I I have a 
a big fascination and love for museums. So I love to go to museums generally, and I haven't been able to do that. Um, and also revisit some of my favorite museums all the time if they have new exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't been able to do that during the pandemic. So I've I've had to get more out into like some nature. And my boyfriend and I we bought uh, like some race no, some road bikes uh, last summer oh, and started um, biking around Copenhagen and. I actually found that there is this path, it's a very long path. Um, it's like on the edge of Copenhagen uh, called Vestvolden, uh, which is just a very, very long route. It used to be the old um, fortress surrounding mm. uh, Denmark. It was made, uh, made back in the 1800s, I think. Mm. But it's just a really beautiful uh, like uh, nature site, uh, very, straightforward <laughs> surrounded by some trees and there are some yeah. goats and stuff <laughs> now i know what we're doing when we have our reunion exactly we're going there exactly. <laughs> doing the whole doing the trip but it's pretty long it's like uh, 13 kilometers long so cool. you can just like take it around and then you end up out on uh, ama if you remember like in copenhagen there's like the middle copenhagen and then ama is like a little island next to copenhagen uh, it's where Christiania is. That's okay. placed on Ama. That's like another part of Copenhagen. Uh, but there's a lot of a big, big nature area out there on Ama. Uh, that's also very nice to bike around. So Perfect. you can go out there if you want to just see some Danish people taking a walk in the pandemic times. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Any Danish books or film or television that you've been ingesting or just all-time favorites you could give to our audience? I'm not that much into Danish TV shows. It's usually uh, the um, we have like the, the national TV uh, Danish TV channel uh, makes a lot of uh, shows. Usually one for the spring and one for the autumn. But I usually think the quality is quite poor. Uh, and for some reason, Danish actors, I think within the recent years, have started mumbling a lot. And I often can't even make out what they're saying because they're mumbling so much <laughs> and it's kind of disturbing so i'm not watching that many danish tv shows i think um what about borgen they speak pretty clearly in borgen yeah i actually thought that was an example of them being very oh the mumbling, mumbling. <laughs> maybe it's because yeah. i'm watching them reading yeah, the subtitles, subtitles. <laughs> yeah <laughs> then it just sounds like oh. <laughs> yeah. the closed captioning is not fuzzy at all it's very clear yes <laughs> Um, but um, I would say movies, if you should check out some Danish movies, uh, definitely check out uh, the other movies that the directors of Flickering Lights made. They are like some true classic. Yeah. Like Adam, Adam's Apple was like required viewing for my Danish class. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, but that, I actually also thought about recommending that one, but uh, mm. great that you've already watched it. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess also The Hunt was also a pretty good, yeah. like, it's, that's a very serious movie and very, yeah. very gloomy topic, but Thought -provoking, very interesting. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, really feel sorry for his character, like. <laughs> yeah. Um, but otherwise, I can't really think of that much. I think I'm mostly into the, the old classics, or not, they're not like old, old, they're like 15, 20 years old or something mm -hmm. like that. But. Mm -hmm. Like within the recent years, besides uh, another round, uh, I can't really think of that many great movies. I think I'm not that much of a nationalist when it comes to <laughs> our <laughs> cinematic performances. That's okay. We're we're not we're not we're not nationalists on this podcast either. So, so. <laughs> it's in the name. Yeah, exactly. So, what is the what's the what's the first thing that you're going to do when the pandemic is totally over and and like all of Denmark is vaccinated? What what's the first trip you're going to take, or just like general activity you're looking forward to? Oh well, that's a good question. I I think right now I've just gotten so used to not going anywhere and being like in the <laughs> in the sleep mode with my <laughs> life. But um, my my boyfriend hasn't yeah. traveled that much, uh, so I hope to get to travel somewhere. Um, uh, we're both really want to go to Japan. Uh, so that could be a very interesting destination, uh, but maybe also something a little closer to home. A few more, a few more questions and then, uh, and then we can let you go here. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, sure. all right. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, how has your opinion of Americans and American in general changed over these last 10 years? 
Oh, wow. That's a, that's a deep one. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, I found it. Yeah, it. It was all Walter. Oh, well, uh, do you want my honest opinion? <laughs> please, please. That's please. all we do on the show. Oh, really? Okay. Because 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 brutal honesty. We know really? how we come off to the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, are you sure? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's, I, I can't remember when it was, but I think, I guess it started with the Trump election. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I think it went pretty downhill from there. Like, um, but I I don't know if it's generally the the American population, but I think there's just been a like uh, a downfall of society all over the world in general. Like with all the spreading of like of fake news, like to cite Trump. <laughs> um, but it it just seems to be. Uh, like a little more explosive in the United States, as I as I see it, um, that there are a lot of these also conspiracy theories that like um, derive from the American population about <laughs> Illuminati and I, I and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so and also so, the the storming of the Congress recently was also just like a mind blow of how could that even happen? <laughs> I know. Now have those conspiracy theories crossed the pond too, like you guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and are there it's, believers, like like groups that are following the insane American conspiracies? Yeah, actually, in the recent years, I have been following uh, uh, a guy who claims to be some kind of politician. He's tried to make a party um, where uh, he's talking. He's an, he used to be some kind of uh, big banker. Uh, and claims to know everything about how banking is going down and money is being produced and uh, has this idea that it all derives from uh, the Illuminati. There, there's the world's evil there we go. That, that, and yeah, that, uh, that is trying to make everything miserable for uh, all the people around the world. Um, and he's, he's, it's, it's a subculture thing. I think here in Denmark, I think it's, it's very few people who actually believe it in, 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 in that sense, but it is starting to, to roll out. And I see, uh, the posts on Facebook and stuff where there's being, it, it sort of goes down that, that alley, <laughs> like very slowly. And, and also even, um, oh, I don't know if I should say this, but. Uh, right when the vaccination program stad- started and the Pfizer vaccine came and everything, there was also a lot of uh, general uh, mistrust in the vaccine due to some of these uh, conspiracy theories from, yeah, I, I don't know if they're mem- American per se, but I, I've seen a lot of American videos about vaccine mistrust. Uh, yeah. And even that's what I was going at uh, my, my own brother actually had uh, some second thoughts about getting vaccinated at that point. I, I think he's changed now, but he was just like, oh, what is it with this vaccine? How, is, how did they make it so fast? And like started questioning it. And mm. this whole thing about, oh, we're just asking questions, not, not my brother, but, but these groups of people. Like, oh, we're just asking the questions. Like, why is this happening? Why is that happening? And it's just, yeah, but it's stupid questions. If you actually research this, you would find out. <laughs> and it's it's just become a thing i think that that yeah. people are getting stupider and mm. getting uh, information from the w- wrong sources and yeah. they think as soon as they've done a googling and they end up in some kind of weird forum oh that's where i get my answers about anti vaccines and stuff like yeah that. i mean that's how trump got elected in the first place was that yeah. people only ingested the information that social media that they wanted they filtered out anything that didn't already give them the bias that they believed in so that's yeah, only exactly. been spread Echo the vaccine. Chambers. Mm. yeah yeah so yeah uh, we ex- i experience that shit every day so yeah I, now I'm i know little, i know a little disheartened uh, to hear that but also not too surprised yeah i i know that walter wanted to ask you a, a follow-up on uh the pandemic but before he does i wanted to also ask both mental health and physical health it's no secret that you guys tend to live quite a bit longer than we do. So what type of Danish foods do you think Americans would be well placed to adopt in our (laughs) day-to-day eating? Because I I have some very specific memories of Danish food, all of them very positive, I would say. A lot of fisk. Uh, On on the health side or on the taste side? Both. (laughs) Let's go with both. Yeah. Ah, okay, because I mean, 
of course is are you asking for like general uh like suggestions or recommendations for danish food is that where you're going at <laughs> or i mean that's like the subtle that's like the subtle inference but i'm basically more i'm getting more like why is it that danish people have like what is it that you guys are eating that makes you so much more healthy well i'm not really sure it's it's mainly the uh the food i think the risk. <laughs> what? the ukulelisk food and <laughs> ukulelisk food but I, I think it's more uh organic I think, folks yeah i think it, it goes back to also the healthcare system generally mm. that we're also doing a lot of uh, prevention and, and campaigns to promote uh more healthy lifestyle style in general and mm. also physical activity uh so the whole health picture does not only come down to people eating healthy uh right I, but I think in the recent years, and also actually recently, there's just been released uh, new uh, eating advices here in Denmark that are both uh, climate friendly and uh, healthy. Uh, that's the new wow. thing. Wow! Wow! Um, so and 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 they go by uh, like eat uh, a lot of vegetables and and fruit and eat a lot of grains, eat less meat, uh, uh, eat fish. Um, fisk. And of course, uh, yeah, <laughs> fish. Um, and uh, of course, cut down on sugar and alcohol. Um, so I think I think that's the general. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's universally understood. That's what we should do, but not necessarily what uh, we do do. No, I'm not. I don't think that most people in Denmark do either. I have very good memories of our our breakfast at Grundbigs. A lot of brown bread with fish and remoulade sauce and like salads and cheeses and i i cheese and salad <laughs> yeah but that, that's not the healthy op options though but the hey the brown ones. bread's healthy that's yeah yeah the, the, the rye bread right. yeah. yeah 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 i miss that stuff yeah you um, can you can bake it yourself <laughs> Wow, we'll have to look That's, into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One step at a time. Times, there's a lot of time to research. I've started doing a lot of like sourdough recipes. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was kind of a meme during the quarantine. It was like, you learn yeah. how to make sour bread. Yeah, sourdough exactly. Bread. And I, I gave into that one. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to say my favorite sentence in Danish, pretty much the only one I remember, and I want to know if you can understand it. Yeah, we're going to hate when Gulerude Ukelowisk. <laughs> I I got the first and the last part. You have again hand gul ekologisk. Gulerude. 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 Gulerud. It's carrot. How do you say? Yeah, gulerud. Gul gulerud. 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 And then ekologisk. Yeah, ekologisk. Then you say that first, and you say ekologisk gulerud. Ah, yeah, we're gonna hear ekologisk gulerud. Ekologisk gulerud. Yeah. That's a great sentence. It's it's what you need when you're in Denmark. That's yeah, everywhere you go. You just <laughs> just scream forget that. about where is and what that. <laughs> just just <laughs> tusen, and talk. Tusen, talk. They don't really say the tusen in any of the films we watch. It's always just talk. Talk for yeah. We're very humble. We don't like exaggerate things <laughs> too much. <laughs> we do. Mm. Mm. What's your <laughs> talking <favorite? ab> <laughs> Well, talking about health, I actually. I have to confess that my one of my favorite shows during the pandemic has been uh, this TLC show um, <laughs> called One Thousand Pound Sisters. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, it's like a guilty pleasure. It's so but I... depressing. <laughs> have you seen it? It's these two sisters that you I... follow and try to get into a weight loss. I watched half of the first episode and felt so deeply depressed. <laughs> But yeah, but it's depressing at the same time. It's but I also think, it, especially in uh, regards to psychology, I also, I also find them very fascinating. Yeah. Oh, then I watched the last episode to see if one of them actually did lose enough weight to get yeah. surgery. Mm. Yeah, one of them did in, yeah. in the first season, and then she got pregnant during the uh, second season and gained a little bit. But the other one gained a lot more and is like kind of dying. It's really sad. Yeah. <laughs> this wow. is America. Woo. Yeah, uh, but I just thought about it when you talk about health, because then I thought, oh, that's the American health standard. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal Walter's question for the close here. Um, aside from sourdough bread recipes, are there, are there other things that the pandemic has, has, has uh, allowed you to like, discover or learn about yourself? Oh, wow. Thank um, you. <laughs> wow. 
So don't worry about myself. Um, thank you, thank you. Actually, I think recently, um, because during most of the pandem pandemic, I've been uh, in school writing my master's thesis, and then recently in uh, January, I finished it. Um, so I've actually just been living like the sweet student life and having fun with that. But then uh, when I started working and working from home and having Zoom classes, I actually, uh, to my surprise, found that I don't really like that much working from home. I thought it would be like, great, I'm just all home all the time, I can do my sourdough. Mm. But it really makes me, it, it, it's hard for me to, to like get off work because I feel like I can work all the time. I, it, it kind of stresses me out a little bit actually because, oh, I have to check this email. I always have access to my, to my work. Um, and I actually thought during my master thesis that, oh, I really want to work from home. That's a, that's a great thing. Um, but now being in the middle of it, it's, it's kind of annoying actually. So I yeah, get you, can't, to school. you can't clock in and clock out. You don't have that luxury of turning it off when it's over. No, exactly. Always and in I, the office. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I actually thought I, I would be really good at mastering that, but being like in a, in a profession where you work a lot with your head, uh, then it's, it's hard to just tick out. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not really sure I found a way to cope yet. Uh, but I just try to like get through my routines, like get up every morning, uh, put on some clothes, not just sitting in my <laughs> jogging pants. Yeah. Um, and, and also stay in touch with uh, a lot of my friends, uh, call them on the phone and call my family and stuff like that. Yeah. That was a huge kind of theme of our show at the start of the pandemic was to, you know, social isolation is so easy right now and you yeah. have to reach out. You need to, especially also working in a different space. Like don't just like do your work in your bedroom or something you want, or your like TV room. You want like an office somewhere that you can like separate yourself mentally. Yeah. Like, it's easier said than done for some people. Yeah, especially we live in a very small apartment. So both my boyfriend and I, we sit and work from home. So we're like both in, in the living room office at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, challenge. Well, I'm glad that you've been able to, you know, to manage all things considered. I think you're probably in one of the, uh, I would may, probably, maybe I can go ahead and say the best country in the world for probably being able to, to deal with pandemic. So, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're there and I wish we were there and I'm sure we'll all be there. <laughs> we'll all be there we'll together be back. one of these days. We'll be back. We'll be back. Goddamn right. Hey. We'll be back. But, uh, Our but favorite Marie, place. it's the best time of my life ever. I love Denmark. I love Danish culture. I love everything Denmark. I can't wait oh that's that. so nice to hear <laughs> i'd love to see you guys again so please come to denmark and i'll i'll show you the good places in copenhagen <laughs> sounds Great. good all right we'll, we'll we'll take you up on it and we'll try not to just spend our entire time hanging out in christiania yeah <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, Marie, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on uh, Global Gab. This was, and this is a big deal. This is our first uh, Global Gab, but not Global Gag episode. So thank you for getting us out of that and uh, in, into the new, <laughs> into the new rhythm here. Yeah. Out of the 2020 funk into the future. Well, yeah. it's been a pleasure for me too. It's so nice to catch up with you guys. Some really challenging questions. I have to like speak on behalf of my nation. So I know, right? <laughs> and, and not in your native tongue, also. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, well, let's keep let's keep the uh, the American Danish movie exchange going, and we'll have uh, we'll have some more to talk about when uh, when we all meet up in Denmark one of these days. Yeah, I'd love to. Can't wait. All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks for joining, Marie, and uh, take it easy, both of you. Stay safe, everybody. Keep it spicy. All right, guys. Stay frosty. Bye bye. <laughs> Bye.